Hello, and um, we're very pleased to be here tonight. I'm honored, I'm Sue Fishkoff, and I'm very honored to be here in conversation with Masha Gessen. I was here last year uh, when she spoke, and I'm a fan of her writing, and I'm um, very excited to have this conversation with her and with you tonight. Um, as, as Barbara said, Masha is right now on tour with her new book, Where the Jews Aren't, the sad and absurd story of Birbijan, Russia's Jewish autonomous region. And um, we're, we're going to talk about that book first and then move to talking about Putin and move to talking about the election of Trump and the essay that she wrote last week in the, in the New York uh, Review of Books. But I do want to turn to this marvelous little book first and this topic because there is there are parallels to be drawn between all three topics. Uh, Joseph Stalin, uh, it, who, who upon whose order Birbijan was created ostensibly as a Jewish national homeland 75 years ago, there are parallels that can be drawn between him as an autocrat and the totalitarian regime that he headed, and Putin, who is the head of um, Russia today, and there are parallels that Masha has drawn between Putin and Donald Trump, our president-elect. So we will talk about all of that, but I do first want to um, turn to this book and to the story of Birbijan. Um, Birbijan, godforsaken place in the Russian Far East. You call it the worst good idea ever in your book, and I think that's a marvelous way to explain to explain it, to describe it. I'd like you to talk about what is Birbijan, why was it created, who came there, and why was it such a good, bad idea? Thank you. I, I should point out that the, this is probably the highest concentration of people who have been to Birbijan that has ever uh, gathered in the United States, because both of us have been to Birbijan. <laughs> uh, I was there for the 70th anniversary, and you were there five years later. I was there right. in 2004, you were there in 2009. In 2009. So exactly. we'll compare some of the people that we met in right. good old times. Right. Um, so Birbijan, uh, the Jewish Autonomous Region, was conceived in the 1920s because the original Soviet project presupposed that the nationalities would all, uh, it, it was, the, it was the, the anti-imperial empire, right? So it was internationalist in spirit. And that meant that, that every nationality had to have an equal piece of the pie, and that meant it, it had to have its own territory in which it had a cultural autonomy. And of course, because this was an anti-religious empire, the Jews were a nationality, it was an ethnic group like any other, and so they needed a territory. And the people, who, uh, the territory that seemed most suitable was the one uh, in the far, far east on the border with contested Manchuria at the time, now China. Uh, not a terribly hospitable place. But the people who went there were mostly desperate Jews from what had been the Pale of Settlement. Because what had happened in 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution was that on the one hand, uh, the limits on Jewish citizenship were lifted overnight, right? Jews were allowed to live anywhere, uh, hold any job, uh, all these restrictions that had been in place th um, for more than 100 years were lifted. On the other hand, private enterprise became illegal very soon. And of course, all the Jews, or virtually all the Jews, in what had been the Pale of, of Settlement, what is now Belarus and Ukraine, had been small tradesmen. They had not worked the land, uh, they had all been in private enterprise, and so they were elevated to full citizenship and impoverished at the very same time. And Birbijan seemed the answer to, to many of those people, especially because they got a, a subsidized one-way ticket. And they were told that they would be able to go there and work the land and be thereby productivized by working the land. Um, and the first shipment, uh, uh, came to Birbijan in 1928, and people continued to settle there until the first purges hit in 1934. 
And some American Jewish communists answered the call as well um, to Birabijan. Um, there was in Petaluma, right near here, there were uh, right before right before, right after the First World War, it was a Jewish socialist farm. And when Birabijan was created, some uh, about 10 or 12 families went to Palestine, to Kibbutzim, and about 10 or 12 families went to Birabijan. So who were these Americans who, who went? And some of the writings today about Birabijan have this kind of nostalgic view and talk about the heroic pioneers who answered the call to go there and too bad it was a doomed experiment. Do you see anything sort of um, glorious or heroic in any of the people who went there in their ideals or was it just doomed to fail from the beginning? Oh sure, they were glorious and heroic. I mean, you know, I don't, full disclosure, I don't find glorious and heroic to be terribly appealing qualities, but, uh, uh, but I did think that the idea of autonomism was a fascinating uh, and uh, and wonderful idea and very poetic. And so uh, a character in the book is somebody who n never had anything to do with Birabijan itself. It's uh, Shimon Dubnov, or Simon Dubno, uh, as, as he's spelled in, in English, a wonderful, uh, nearly forgotten, uh, turn of the century Jewish historian and thinker who originated the idea of autonomism. And his argument was that the, um, the Jews had achieved sort of the pinnacle of nationhood. Uh, that uh, he was an evolutionist. Uh, he was writing, you know, it wasn't that long after Darwin, uh, the, the, the Darwinian revolution. So he was writing very much in those terms. And so in his, in his universe, the lowest step, stage of evolution for nation was tribal, uh, tribe. And then the next stage was nation state. And then the ultimate stage was cultural nation that had dispensed with the trappings of state that did not have a military, that could not threaten neighboring nations, that did not have uh, a military claim to land, and uh, that being diasporic was connected only by, by culture. And that's how he saw the Jews. And, you know, reading the, his writing in the early 21st century, uh, I find absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, because that was his argument against the Zionist idea. And of course, the other thing that fascinated me about the idea of Birabijan is that there was a point, albeit brief, but there was a point when it seemed like the rational alternative to the zany Zionist idea, mm. right? Why would you go to the desert where you were not welcome, where you would have to, uh, the, the, the idea of resurrecting a dead language, of creating a Jewish military. All of that seemed so insane. And then there was the rational argument that Jews should live where they have become accustomed to living. They should enjoy the military protection of an existing state. Uh, but what they needed to do was they needed, a, uh, they needed to take advantage of full citizenship while also having a hedge against assimilation, which was the price the Jews had been paying for full citizenship elsewhere in Europe, and this hedge could be, could be cultural autonomy. That's the autonomous idea. And it's such a great idea, uh, which, is, which, which is what really drew me to the story. And the physical hardships that the early pioneers suffered were tremendous, similar to the physical hardship that the Zionist pioneers suffered in Palestine, but they had a lot more help, right, from outsiders and, and other things. But um, there, in addition to the physical hardships in Birabijan, there really was in the early years a kind of attempt at the flowering of Yiddish culture that then came to naught later. Could you talk a little bit about that um, growth of Jewish of Yiddish culture as an right. expression of Jewish national aspirations? Right. So the uh, the major major character in the book is actually the writer David Bergelson, uh, or Bergelson, who is um, who's another. Uh, nearly forgotten figure of, uh, of of Jewish history, but in the uh, in the early 20th century and then in the interwar period, he was a major Yiddish language writer, and not just a major Yiddish language writer, but a um, 
uh, an organizer of the Yiddish language literary world. He was a publisher, he was a magazine editor, he was a convener of, uh, of, of literary circles and circles of cultural activity. Um, the, he was the convener of the Kultura League, which was the Yiddish language uh, artistic collective in post-revolutionary Kiev. And um, Bergelson found himself in exile in Berlin in the 1930s, uh, feeling very much the, the ill portents of, uh, uh, of German politics, looking for a place to go. He considered New York. He was a writer for the forward, uh, which is how he was able to lead a pretty nice life in Berlin because he was making uh, a, a dollar salary at the forward. But ultimately, he thought that um, the United States was going to become a Yiddish desert. Uh, the Jews in the United States were, were assimilating. Uh, and the Soviet Union held out this promise of a real Yiddish cultural capital. And Birabijan was supposed to be this, this, uh, this region where Yiddish was going to be the state language, it was going to be the, a language of education, it was going to be a language of publishing, a language of literature. It was going to be the, the Yiddish center of the world. And Bergelson uh, sort of bought his ticket back to the Soviet Union with his propagandizing in favor of Birabijan in the diaspora press. So um, the reason, uh, or probably the primary reason, that those Jews from California, as well as Jews from New York, as well as Jews from Argentina, went to Birbijan, and altogether it was about a thousand families who came from outside the Soviet Union. The reason they went to Birbijan was because they read Bergelson's manifestos in favor of Birbijan as a Yiddish cultural center. And it started out that way. There was Yiddish language education. Uh, there was Yiddish language publishing. There was a Yiddish language newspaper. Um, there, uh, there was going to be um, a Yiddish. Uh, Yiddish was going to be established as the state language once Birabijan was uh, fully constituted as an autonomous republic. That was a status it never reached because that, uh, that project was scrapped in 1934 when the first purges began in Birabijan. Um, because the internationalist project ran up against the nationalist project, which uh, coexisted in the Soviet Union like so many other contradictions coexisted in the Soviet Union. And when the nationalist project sort of got the better of the internationalist project, um, nationalism became a crime. And uh, and all these, uh, the, basically, the entire party elite of Birabijan was arrested and executed. And the project of uh, of turning Birabijan into an autonomous republic was scrapped. And Yiddish didn't exactly go underground, but the cultural project project disappeared. And the cynicism behind what, how Stalin um, treated Birabijan, you say the, the entire elite of Birabijan who were arrested and executed, they were arrested and executed for doing precisely what he had told them to do, which is try to revive Jewish cultural autonomy. And then they ran up against his Russification project. When, um, when was the final death knell struck uh, in Birabijan? I don't know that there's anything ever any, uh, anything's ever final. I mean, you know, and this 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 starts to to get us toward the um, the much more relevant topic of our conversation, um, which is you know everything unfolds over time. Nothing is ever uh, the, the, the 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 sort of the once and forever break with what you thought was going to happen. So uh, Birabijan continues to be called the Jewish Autonomous Region to this day. All 1,000 Jews in Birabijan live in the Jewish Autonomous Region. Out of 75,000 total of people. Oh, more than 200,000. Really? No, so it's no? less than okay. half of 1%, yeah. Um, but it's the Jewish Autonomous Region. Uh, so it was never quite over, uh, except, of course, the, 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 the dream was killed and many, many people were killed. Both you and I were there, as you start out to say. You wrote about your trip to Birabijan in the book. You went in 2009. 
um, it's, uh, you called it a great falsification of history, a, uh, what was it, shtetl, Theme park? A shtetl theme park, yes. Uh, talk to us about your visit there, and I'll share some of what I saw as well. Um, so I, I, I tried to look for, the, the, one of my projects in Birbijan was just going to the state archives, which was not a terribly rewarding project because the state archives had, were in the process of, of pretty much shutting down. Um, and it's very, it was easier to get access to archival materials back in 2009 than it is now, but even then it was very, very difficult. Um, and my other project was looking for signs of Jewishness in the Jewish autonomous region. So I, um, uh, I, I, I decided to look for Jewish food. And I don't know what your experience was with that. I, uh, did you, did you look I, for I Jewish like food? Russian food, so I didn't look yeah, for Jewish Russian food there. Oh, well, see, I lived in Moscow. I had, I had all the Russian food I could, uh, I, I could, I could um, wish for. So I decided to look for Jewish food, and, uh, and I asked where I should go, and I was told I should go to the Chinese restaurant. Uh, <laughs> and... And I went to the Chinese restaurant and I asked for the Jewish menu and they said, well, it's been discontinued for lack of demand. Uh, so I looked at the regular menu and ordered the fruit plate, which arrived with a giant uh, bowl of mayonnaise in the middle. And when it was set on the table, the light bulb above my head exploded into the mayonnaise. Uh, <laughs> Which, you know, I'm not sure it, it was anything specifically to do with Birbhajan, but somehow it's been an unforgettable uh, <laughs> episode. Uh, but, um, um, and then um, uh, I didn't give up, although maybe I should have. So I went to, the, to, to a cafe that was called something like the Birbhajaner Cafe. And, uh, and in the Birbhajaner Cafe, there was the Birbhajaner schnitzel on the menu. So I ordered that and it turned out to be pork. Uh, and um, uh, and then um, I uh, I finally was told that there was a Jewish menu in my hotel, uh, which you had to ask for special. So it was like a secret menu at Starbucks. But uh, uh, so I, I asked for the Jewish menu, and they they brought it out to me, and it said Shalom at the top of the menu, and it had like four items on it, of which they only had one, which was gefilte fish. fish. Uh, and um, and then I, I watched, because I could sort of see into the kitchen, as they took the gefilte fish out of Manyashev's jar and heated it up <laughs> before serving it. And um, I was there in October 2004 for the 70th anniversary of the establishment of it as a, as a region. Um, and I took the train there overnight. There were supposed to be a lot of other foreign press there, BBC and CNN, and they had flown in with their crews. And when I showed up on the train, I was the only foreign journalist there because overnight the Beslan school hostage crisis had happened. And all the uh, journalists from the real publications went to Beslan. And there I was, a freelancer, and they held their party for me. Um, they were still putting up the Sholem Alechem statue in the main square, and they took me around to see the menorah at the train station. Um, and then they had their parade, which they have every other year. And there's little children in, um, in wagons, like out of Anachevka, little boys, little Gentile boys with side curls and little Gentile girls dressed with the headscarves. And they're all doing Yiddish dances and Yiddish songs. And, you know, we can laugh at it, we can chuckle at it, but it really is this, to me, it was the same as um, Pioneer Days in this country, right, in the American West, where uh, children dress up uh, in the, you know, the, the wagons moving west, or if you go to Colonial Williamsburg. And these non-Jewish children in Birbijan really look to Yiddish and the Eastern European Ashkenazi Jewish pioneers that built their city as their pioneers. And it was really interesting to me. There was a, a course uh, in Yiddish language at the local language institute, and nobody in the course is Jewish. It's all non-Jewish students and graduate students learning Yiddish, and they're not doing it because they're particularly, you know, Semitophiles. They're doing it because they see it as the history of their city. So it's just very interesting for American Jews to see that culture in this godforsaken place eight time zones from Moscow. 
Well, it's, 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 it, it really raises the question of what the Jewish heritage is. I mean, it's such an absurd snapshot of it, but it's also a very telling one um, because there's so many assumptions that American Jews have about what, Jew, what constitutes Jewishness. Right? And some of those assumptions are also in display in Birbhajan. So, for example, there's, there's a great Lubavitcher presence in Birbhajan. Uh, they fund the synagogue and the community center. And the synagogue never gets a minion. Uh, but the community center gets a crowd sometimes. Uh, and the community center is called Freud in, uh, in Yiddish, which is joy, in case you don't know. <laughs> So one of the themes that uh, you write about in your book is that Jews are always leaving, and they're never, never at home. And that theme of knowing when to leave, that Jews survive by knowing when to leave and knowing what to bring with them, is part of your personal history as well. You left uh, the Soviet Union as a teenager of 14 with your family and came to this country. And then you went back to Russia and then you left Russia three years ago to come back to this country. Well, that was good planning, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you, might, you might rethink that now. <laughs> but I wonder if you might share with us something about your upheaval at the age of 14 to come to this country and what that has to say about American Jewish misunderstanding of what Jewish identity in the former Soviet Union really represented. So when I was growing up, um, I knew what Jewish was, right? Jewish was probably not being able to get into the university of my choice, or possibly any university, uh, having a very difficult time as early as elementary school, being singled out for being Jewish, getting beaten up a lot for being Jewish. That's what being Jewish was, right? Um, and... Um, uh, being Jewish was also a stroke of luck. It was very clear in the 1970s when I was growing up because Jews could potentially get an exit visa. And uh, when we got an exit visa and we came to this country and this, it was, uh, we owed this ability to get an exit visa to the American movement for Soviet Jewry. And the, of course the premise of the American movement for Soviet Jewry was that Soviet Jews needed the freedom to be Jewish. What my family and I and everyone we knew wanted was the freedom to not be Jewish. Because being Jewish was getting beaten up and, and not being able to get into university. Uh, and that was, that was our legacy, that was our heritage. It had been for generations. Uh, you know, um, nobody I knew spoke Yiddish or, uh, or was observant. And in fact, not only did, uh, well, I mean, my great-grandmother spoke Yiddish, but since, uh, after my great-grandfather died when I was very little, no one, she had no one to speak Yiddish to. And she very specifically told my mother and me that she would not teach us Yiddish because it, was, it would hold us back in life, right? It was this magical language that by, you know, by dint of even knowing the language, you would be held back in life, right? Um, so the, the way to, to be a free person was to not be Jewish. And then of course, when we came here, we were like all other uh, immigrants from the former, so Jewish immigrants from, from the Soviet Union, greeted by very generous, very well-meaning American Jews who wanted to help us become Jewish, which was pretty much the last thing we wanted to do. Did they take you to synagogue or? Yep. <laughs> And um, our misunderstanding as, as American Jews of what uh, Soviet Jews wanted was related to the Israeli deliberate, perhaps, misunderstanding of what uh, Soviet and then Russian Jews were and represented. And, and um, you shared with me before we came on today the story of your, um, your experience at the holding camp in Vienna with the Sochnut, the Jewish agency, and I wonder if you would tell that story as well. Um, sure, I mean, uh, I think it, it's, it's sort of a, 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 a double-edged sword for me because I should probably, in, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for the sake of full disclosure, say that I actually wanted to go to Israel. Uh, at I, 14. At 14. I uh, did not believe my parents 
that it could possibly be safe for Jews to live in a country where Jews were a minority. I thought that they were insane. That if we're going to go so far as to leave the Soviet Union, we should go to Israel. Right? Uh, and they were clearly deluded to want to go to America. They wanted to go to America, so they said, you know, oh, you have to come to America with us and please play along. Uh, and uh, and then once once you have your green card, you can move to Israel if you want to, which I did at the age of 15 and quickly thought better of it. But um, um, at the, so at the time we were in this, uh, we, we left the Soviet Union, we, we have no passports, right? All we have are these exit visas and, um, and nothing, you know, no, no worldly possessions except for one suitcase per person. Uh, and there's a holding camp in Vienna, where, uh, which is run by Sachnut, the Israeli absorption agency. Uh, and then this is where you get a chance to declare that you are not actually planning to go to Israel and you would like to be handed over to the Hebrew Immigration Assistance, uh, the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, HIAS, to be processed for another country, maybe the United States, maybe Canada, maybe Australia, which happens in a refugee camp in, in Italy. So, and, and, um, and this processing happens uh, family by family. So you don't have the comfort of, uh, of other dropouts, as they called us. Uh, because by that point, point, it was a very small minority who were going to Israel. So we, walked, we were called into this office. I knew my parents were really nervous. I had been a nervous wreck since we got our exit visas. So my parents, because I, was, I kept picking at myself and picking at my fingers, my parents bought me some worry beads to, um, so that I, I would stop picking at myself. So I'm walking around with these worry bees and we walk into this guy's office and he says, only the Arabs use those in Israel. <laughs> Which was so humiliating. Uh, and um, uh, anyway, we dropped out. We went to, uh, t t uh, t to Italy and then a couple of months later we, we came to the United States. And since you have um, been a writer, your writing career, you've really um, written a lot about the dangers of totalitarianism. That's one of your major themes. It's in Birbijan, where Stalin figures as a major character. Uh, you wrote a book about Vladimir Putin, and certain parallels can be drawn to Stalin with Putin. Um, have you met Putin? Funny you should ask. Um, yes, but this was um, not while I was researching the book. Uh, the, uh, I actually wrote the book without having access to Putin because I had been blacklisted by the Kremlin for uh, s since Putin first came to power. Uh, but he apparently didn't know my name when I was blacklisted. I was blacklisted by uh, some flunky. And then it so happened that in 2012, uh, w at the same time that the book came out in the West, the, I was editing a popular science magazine that Putin was very fond of. And then I was asked by the publisher to send a reporter on Putin's hang gliding adventure with the Siberian cranes. And I said no, uh, because I didn't, uh, I, this was not a principled journalistic stand, actually. It was a very pragmatic plan on my part because I thought if we don't send a reporter, then we were not going to see something horrible that we would then publish in the magazine that would get us shut down. Basically, being a popular science magazine, we can just look the other way. And I knew enough to know that when Putin carried out his nature conservation efforts, things usually went wrong. And so I said to my publisher, I don't want to send a reporter because something will go wrong and you are not going to want me to put it in the magazine. And he fired me. And then I tweeted about it and then Putin called me on the phone and invited me to come in because he liked the magazine and he wanted to put it back together again. And not only did I think that when he called me it was a hoax and I should come up with something really funny to say, which I didn't, uh, so I'm glad it wasn't on YouTube, uh, but, um, but then when I went in, uh, I thought, I, I was very excited because it was like going in to meet a character from my book, right? I had, in a way, I felt like I had made him up, uh, which, is, which is the way you always feel when you write a book, but especially when you write a book about someone you don't have access to. 
which which I'd done a couple of times. Uh, and so this this was this you know you when when you do what journalists call a write around, it's like the goal of that write around is to to write the contour of the thing that you can't actually touch. And um, and so I felt like I, I had created it, and part of me really wanted to, him to be different than the character I had written because the character I had written was actually not terribly interesting. Uh, I mean I think it's an interesting book, but the character himself is mediocre and not very intelligent and not terribly compelling. And the book had in fact been criticized for that, um, which I think is interesting uh, in 2016 because some of the reviewers wrote quite uh, explicitly that mediocre people do not become leaders of great countries. Uh, and that what was wrong with the book. And, um, uh, and then part of me wanted to be proven right. And I'm sad to say I was proven right. <laughs> uh, the guy I met was as two-dimensional and interestingly as, as uninformed as I had imagined. He knew very little about me. He had not been properly briefed for all sorts of reasons. But among other things, he didn't know about the book. Because in order for him to know about the book, someone would have had to tell him about the book. And nobody wanted to be that person. So, and the criticism that you received for not making him into a monster, I, I see parallels between that and the criticism, you know, criticisms of Hannah Arendt's book, the banality of evil, right? Seeing the idea of uh, you know bu bureaucrats and the evil that mediocre bureaucrats and mediocre people can prove to be even more dangerous per than um, than pure evil. Uh, what is, if, if Putin is mediocre, what is the real danger of his regime and of the autocracy that he represents? Um, what is the real danger? I mean, where do I start? Uh, I think that- and you're uh, personally invested. You, when you wrote the book, you lived there. You were invested as a citizen, oh. as, right? And it had more meaning and significance for you writing about that. Oh, absolutely, uh, and um, and I also had to make a conscious decision uh, while I was writing the book because it, originally I thought we'd probably have to leave uh, before the book was published to be safe, and then I decided to stay. It so happened that the book came out uh, when the protests, the mass protests, broke out in Russia. So all of a sudden, I was just one of many thorns on Putin's side, uh, which I think is, is part of what 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 kept me and my family safe for uh, for a while. Now most of those thorns are in exile, and a few are in jail, and a few are dead. Um, but I think the thing, uh, the, what Hannah Arendt was trying to tell the world, and what uh, several other great thinkers have tried to tell the world since, um, is that uh, you know mediocrity in power is not an exception. Um, there's something quite tempting about the idea, you know, imagining uh, evil as great. Yeah. And that's something, uh, I mean, that's a theme that I've tried to, to, to approach as a writer at various times, including when I was writing about the Sarnaya brothers, the Boston bombers. Because I think that the, the premise of the war on terror uh, is also very much about that. It's sort of, you know, uh, if something is as frightening as terrorism is to us, then we take comfort in thinking that there is a vast army uh, that is that is incredibly well organized, that recruits people and puts them through many paces for years before they become terrorists. Uh, to imagine terrorism as I think it actually works, uh, which is that some ordinary people see a shortcut to becoming somebody and take it quite quickly. And the ideology is usually an afterthought. That's much more frightening. Uh, it's, actually, it's actually less frightening to think of something huge and monstrous than it is to think of something ordinary. And here we are, 2016 in America, after an incredible election, um, talking about the danger of a mediocre person uh, being given tremendous power. 
you have been writing about the election. Um, most notably, last Thursday, the New York Review of Books published your essay, Autocracy, Rules for Survival. And you talk about um, six rules that you put forward as a person who is qualified to write about the dangers of totalitarianism because you lived for decades under such a regime. Could you go through um, what are those rules and why we should be afraid? Oh, um, I don't, I'm not don't sure I can reel them exactly. off, but, um, Just talk but rule number one is, and I think this is actually the most important rule, is believe the autocrat. Because I think that what 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 what, hap what is happening here now, and this is quite familiar to me from Russia, and you know, I don't mean to th to 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 uh, to say that Trump is exactly like Putin, or even very much like Putin. They are, you know, there there are obvious differences. Um, the obvious what are is, they? Well, uh, you know, Putin uh, uh, first of all was enabled by the fact that he came to power uh, on the ruins of a totalitarian regime. Right? A lot of what he's been able to do, a lot of what he's been moved to do, uh, and a lot of what's happened to society is, are, are all consequences of, uh, of his coming to power in a country that had not recovered from totalitarianism, that had not even really begun to recover from totalitarianism. So in that sense, that's a huge difference. Uh, another, another significant difference is that Putin is not himself a charismatic leader. His, his entire charisma, charisma derives from the magic chair that he was placed into by accident. Uh, and um, with Trump, that's not the case. Trump is a, is a classic charismatic leader. Right? Uh, so in that sense, it's much more useful to think about somebody like Mussolini. Right? But, uh, but this actually uh, is getting me to something um, that... Um, that will uh, uh, that will sidetrack us for just for a little bit from from the rules for uh, for survival, but I think it's very important. I want to uh, petition for the repeal of Goodwin's law, right? Um, Goodwin's law, is, as as probably most of you know, is the is the is the um, is the imaginary law that says never resort to comparing th uh, people uh, to Hitler or regimes to Nazism, right? So I think we have to institute something like the opposite of Goodwin's law which is always resort to comparing uh, Trump to Hitler and what's happening here to Nazism. And um, uh, my argument is this, right? Uh, the world, uh, I mean, in uh, the 20th century saw the rise of several autocracies. And I don't think, I'm not aware of an example of a country or a society that was able to resist the rise of an autocracy effectively. So, Maybe there's a way to learn from the failures, right? And that's also what qualifies me to write about it. Because, you know, it's not like we were so successful at resisting Putin. You know, here I sit in San Francisco uh, talking about Putin because I can't actually talk to, about him in Moscow. Uh, but there's still lessons to be learned from failure. And, and maybe our conceit should be that, you know, if any country is going to be able to resist a clear and obvious danger, it should be this country. And to do that, we have to draw on the experience of so many failures of the, of the 20th century and the early 21st century. So one of the failures is the failure to believe an autocrat, right? And I think it's a failure of the imagination. Um, because, and, it's, and it's perfectly natural because all we have to draw on is our experience. And so when, you, when, uh, when pundits were first starting to, to talk about what Trump is going to do now, they were all defaulting to this idea that, oh, well, he's going to be just like a not terribly smart Republican president. Why? There's no reason to say that except that that's what they've seen before. Right? Um, there hasn't been a, uh, a, a politician in American history who ran for autocrat, which is what Trump did, and won. And we really need to be listening to what he has said about what he's going to do. Because that's as close as we're going to get to an understanding of what he's actually going to do. And again, this is something that we did with Putin. You know, Putin said everything that he was going to say uh, when he was first running for office. But you would have people who would, you know, uh, who would be uh, 
trying to prove to you that, oh no, he was going to be a Democrat and a, an economic reformer for no other reason ex that, uh, other than they wanted him to be that, and they also couldn't imagine the worst. Yeah, it's interesting you say believe the autocrats. Uh, during the campaign, when Trump was saying things like he's going to build a wall and he's going to have law and order the day after the election, um, people who supported him would answer, you know, interviewers would come to them and say, how can you vote for somebody who says these things by saying, we don't think, he, he's not going to do those things. That's, we're not voting for him because of those policies, we're voting for him because of what he represents. You know, the change, whatever. I might say that what he represents is the normalization of bigotry and that that's the most dangerous thing, more dangerous than any wall that might be built in this country. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it, it may not be entirely constructive to focus on something like the wall because, yeah, obviously, uh, the wall in the way that he has portrayed it rhetorically is unbuildable. I mean, he's not going to build it not because he doesn't want to build it, but because it's impossible. Right, um, but what he uh, the the intention that he has declared is to uh, uh, to launch a war on immigrants in this country, right? To launch mass deportations. Mass deportations are perfectly plausible. They are going to happen. A war on immigrants is already underway, right? I mean, his his interview on 60 Minutes yesterday made that very very clear. His appointment of Steve Bannon made that very, very clear, right? Uh, this is the thing to believe, to, to, to focus on whether, uh, you know, how many bricks he's going to use and how much of it is going to be chicken wire is, is, is just fruitless and it misses the point. What's your next project? Oh, I... Working on anything? <laughs> uh, I'm 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 working on uh, well actually I'm working on a small book with a photographer uh, with a wonderful photographer named Misha Friedman on the politics of memory in Russia. It's called Never Remember, uh, and uh, I'm also uh, I'm, I'm I'm also uh, working on a uh, on a book in the uh, which is in the proposal stages, which has somehow become a lot more relevant in the in the last week, which is hold, called How to Derail a Democracy. Is actually looking at several Western countries, uh, beginning with Israel, that uh, that have had major problems with uh, with the idea and the building of democracy. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Your Thank you. your insights, your wit, and the seriousness with which you address the topics that you write about. I think. Um, it behooves us all to, to listen and to engage in conversation with each other when we read your writings, and I want to thank you for that. Thank you. And um, we're going to open it up now to questions from the audience. So please put up your hand, and I'm coming to you. Starting with you, sir. Yeah, uh, would you care to comment on the, the, the Putin-Trump romance and uh, what what do you think Putin wants to get from Trump? I, I, I hesitate to ask you what you think Trump will give Putin because I think he'll give him anything, but what, what really does Putin want from Trump? So I, um, you know, I actually wrote uh, a piece in, in July for also for the New York Review of Books criticizing the, uh, this conspiracy thinking uh, uh, and this portrayal of Trump as uh, Putin's agent, because I think it was a very bad way of trying to come to grips with the very American phenomenon that is Donald Trump, right? He's not a foreign agent. Um, Putin's role in the American election is, is the same role that Russia has played uh, in other Western elections, and in fact that the Soviet Union used to play during the Cold War, which was to try to destabilize and disrupt to the, to, to the extent possible. Right, um, the Putin people reached out not only to Trump but also to Jill Stein, who, by the way, sounded exactly like an anchor from Russia Today whenever she was asked about foreign policy. I mean, I it, I really got the impression that she was reading from notes. Uh, but um, she was the Green Party candidate. She was the Green Party candidate. Yeah. Uh, but um, as for as for Trump, 
I think that, uh, that, that, that Moscow viewed him very much as a disruptive candidate. And they were as surprised by his victory as, as anybody else. Um, but what uh, I, I, I don't think this romance is going to last very long. And the re, uh, there, there are two uh, very large reasons for this. One is that Putin actually needs the United States as Russia's enemy in order to maintain his popularity. He is running a mobilization society uh, and the only enemy large enough for Russians to mobilize against is the United States. Becoming friends with America all of a sudden is just not going to be good for Putin's uh, su support at home. And he's hooked in these, you know, stratospheric, uh, on, on these stratospheric su uh, support, uh, support numbers, you know, 82 to 86% popularity. Um, so he needs America as an enemy. The other reason is, 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 is more sort of a question of character. I mean, when have you ever seen two thugs get along? <laughs> it's just not going to happen. I think it's going to be the shortest honeymoon in history. Um, but I think before the honeymoon is over, it's likely that sanctions will be lifted. The sanctions regime is very fragile. Uh, it's it's very very easy to to, to lift, and I and it actually requires sort of consistent political will to keep it in place. So I don't th I don't think that's going to survive, and um, I think that the likelihood uh, that there's a likelihood that that Syria will be abandoned by the United States. Uh, not that the United States has been particularly effective or, uh, in, in in protecting Syrians, but it's going to get worse. Um, and you know, NATO is um, is another issue that's very important to Putin, and very unimportant to Trump. And this is also uh, uh, the 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 maintenance of NATO is also a question of consistent political will. NATO doesn't rest on uh, uh, on you know the, the, the difficult to break laws. It actually rests on consistent renewal of commitment. And so it will be easy, very easy uh, for the United States to turn away from NATO. And that in itself, even if it's a symbolic gesture at first, will effectively give Putin free reign over whatever he thinks he deserves uh, in Russia's immediate and not so immediate neighborhood. Question in the center in the back. So uh, in your article, you talked about, you know, don't trust, don't, don't feel safe about your institutions, right? They can also fail you. Um, and then I guess I, as far as I know, the U.S. has the longest running institutions of this kind. Do you think, like, what would fraying of those institutions look like? What should we be watching out for? Right. So I think a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, a lot of American institutions uh, uh, actually haven't been terribly well maintained, right? Uh, we have seen uh, leading up to this election, uh, you know, for the last 15 years, we've had we've seen consistent concentration of power in the executive branch, uh, with ever weaker checks and balances on that. Uh, we have seen a um, you know a totally dysfunctional Congress. So those are not great signs for what's going to happen. Uh, American institutions have been degrading for a number of years. Uh, the other area of risk is that uh, a lot of institutions aren't codified in law. They rest on, on, on culture and tradition and even habit, right? So one of those institutions is uh, the role of the media. Uh, there's no law that says that the White House has to have daily briefings. There is no law that says that um, the president has to have regular press conferences. Uh, there's no law that says who gets accredited to the White House. Right? It's all a question of habit. Vladimir Putin holds one press conference a year, one call-in show, and then occasionally, if he feels like it, he will hold another event. There's nothing to stop that from happening. And in fact, uh, what we have seen already is, you know, uh, the, the Donald Trump has not made that many statements in the six days since he was elected. His first tweet 
was blaming the media for um, for the protests. Uh, his uh, when he flew to Washington, he was the first president in recorded history who refused to take a press pool with him. Right, so that was the first precedent for denying ac uh, traditional access to the media before he even uh, is inaugurated. Not to mention that you know he banned the Washington Post from his campaign uh, for months and threatened retaliation against Jeff Bezos personally for what he saw as, as poor coverage in the Washington Post. So I think we're going to see a crisis of that particular institution very, very quickly. And that's a cornerstone of, of, of the American system. Right? Um, another, uh, another area that, that, that is already at risk is protest as a democratic institution. We are already seeing this, this creeping delegitimization of protest everywhere, uh, not just from Donald Trump, who again has been, uh, has been tweeting uh, about how unfair the protests are, um, but even among uh, people who are unhappy with election results. Uh, we sort of hear people saying, you know, why protest? There's, there are no clear demands. He hasn't done anything yet. Give the guy a chance. Protest is an institution of democracy. It, is, uh, it, uh, <clears throat> it serves a lot of purposes, one of which is sort of affirmation of unity. Uh, and I think in, this, in, in, in our current situation, it also needs to serve as a sort of an affirmation of the current normal. Right? I think that a very important statement for protesters to make is this is where we stand. Among other things, uh, we have a right to assembly in this country. And this is a right we're affirming now because if this right is curtailed, we're going to take notice. Right? Next question's over here to your left. You, you want to hold it? Okay, I'm used to holding it myself. That's fine. I wonder if you're familiar with the work of the late political theorist Sheldon Wolin, who talks about the situation we have or in this country as inverted totalitarianism. He compared, and also, um, you've spoken a lot about Putin and Trump, and you started to get into something else that Wolin talks about, and that's the degradation of citizenship and the passivity. Um, and that's a situation we have, I think, in this country. We don't expect to take responsibility. We vote. That's a really kind of very narrow and reductive, redu reduced form of citizenship. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I, I know a little bit of his work, very, very little. So I don't really feel like qualified to to talk about it. Um, I'm a little bit of a, of a st stickler for for um, for terms. Uh, so I think that totalitarianism is a very tricky term as it is, and uh, uh, anyway, I, I, um, I, I have a reluctance to, to, to sort of see, see it di diluted. But um, I, may, I may very well be wrong about it because I don't I don't know enough uh, about his work. But um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that 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 uh, dovetails with what we were just talking about uh, with. A common uh, was become a very common misunderstanding of, say, the role of protest. Uh, another thing that uh, that I find really jarring uh, in a lot of American conversations is 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 a, co a basic confusion about what democracy is. Right? Uh, like, for example, when I talk about Putin, I will invariably get a question, uh, the question, but he's very popular, isn't he? Like. Uh, I mean, I, I don't answer this way, but I'm always tempted to answer, so what? Who says that that's important? That that's, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, since when have we been uh, uh, equating democracy and tyranny of the majority? I mean, I thought it was the opposite, right? I thought that democracy was representation, which is the opposite of, of, of tyranny of the, of the majority. But I think that basic uh, uh, conversation about what democracy is isn't happening in this country and hasn't happened in so long that there is a real uh, there is a real lack of understanding. And again, uh, uh, in not just in Trump's rhetoric, but in a lot of um, in much wider circles, we hear this criticism of like, well, you know, if the people elected him, uh, then then we have. Uh, the, limited right to, to, to criticize when 
it's every citizen's duty to be critical of the government. And we take it for granted that the government is legitimately elected before we even start to criticize, right? That's what, that's an important democratic institution. And um, I just want to take that question as well, because I would disagree that we're seeing a degradation of citizenship. In fact, I would argue that since this election, we're seeing an energization, an activization of, of the citizenship of democracy in this country. I think we're going to see more of it, and at a very local level, um, and in our own Jewish community, uh, we have... You'll, you'll read about it in this week's J. Many, many synagogues this Shabbat dedicated their sermons to the election. They saw big turnout for Shabbat services, people wanting to talk to each other, and not just commiserate, not just moan and groan, but really talk to each other. What can we do now? The um, Jewish Family and Community Services of the East Bay has seen a tremendous uptick in the number of volunteers, calls coming in from local Jews this past week to volunteer there to protect the refugees that have been brought in to this country, Syrian, Afghan, Iraqi, Muslim refugees that our Jewish institutions have brought to the Bay Area to resettle, and local Jews concerned that they may be targeted and again, not sitting at home worrying about it, but stepping forward and saying, I want to volunteer, I want to do something about it. So that I see as um, something hopeful and good that is testament to the strength of our active citizenry. Question, question down here in the center. Thank you. Forgive me, is it on? Forgive me, but I'd actually like to ask a little question about Bira Bijan. <laughs> I've, read your, I've read your book. I loved your book. And Thank you. And you talk about how when you were there, the archival materials about the terror that took place both in the 30s and the 40s was unavailable. Well, it was unavailable. Uh, it had been available. A Russian writer copied some of it down, et cetera. Is this, um, is this sort of unique to Biro Bijan, this, uh, th this clamping down of archives, or does this reflect something that's going on throughout Russia? You would think that in Russia, they would want to expose elements of Soviet terror. Um, no, it, it's a great question, uh, and it's actually typical of everything that's going on in Russia, and it has been. Uh, more or less since the archives were opened up. I mean, basically it was, um, I think the decision about whether to have a reckoning was taken very early on. And it, after, the, uh, after broad access to the archives was made available in 1991, by 1993, it started tightening. Uh, since Putin came to power, we've seen a real steady shutdown. At this point, very, very little is available. And, um, you know, I'll, gi I'll, I'll give you specific examples, right? I mean, like in Berbejan, I, I wanted to get um, documents that were in the archives, uh, such as the transcripts of uh, party committee meetings uh, that were uh, at which the purges began, right? Because all of, all of it was highly ritualized. so. I wanted to be able to quote those documents. Uh, that you know, it was all it was all played out like like a play, right? Uh, uh, the the purges weren't secret in that sense, um, but none of, none of that w uh, was available, and um, that's true all over the country. Those kinds of documents have become inaccessible. Uh, but if, for example, you want to find out. Uh, the, something about the individual fates uh, the individual fate of a, of, a, of, a, of a person who was arrested uh, or or executed under Stalin you have to have standing right you have to you have to be a relative and you, and the relationship has to be provable um, or it has to be a, uh, a certain kind of non-governmental organization that can uh, that can uh, uh, apply for access to these documents so that's that's a way to keep a very tight lid on um, uh, uh, on access, but also on the amount of information that is released at any given time. 
because no matter how many people get access to documents individually, you will never see the scope of what happened unless you can see it all at once. Uh, what's been fascinating over the last year is that Ukraine has finally given complete free and open access to all Soviet-era archives. And so, uh, so once, once, once there's enough research that's taking place in Ukraine, once enough people have looked at those archives, we will actually get the best information we've ever had on the, on the scope and, and, and depth and scale of Soviet terror, but only, only because of Ukraine. Next question's here in the front row. Uh, Marsha, it's so great that you're here. I read Anna Politkovskaya's book years ago before I knew about you. And as we know, she was killed. And I saw on Russian television her ex-husband, and he was only an ex-husband, he said, because um, he didn't approve of her traveling around and going to Chechnya, and, and the kids were still young. And so I'm, I'm glad you're here. It's, you know, also um, what happened to, um, of, um, what's his name, Mikhail Hodorkovsky. And of all those oligarchs, um, maybe I didn't understand my Russian isn't good enough, but I don't think he was as bad as all of them. And I think he wanted to do some good. I think he's certainly m more honest than um, Berezovsky, who they say committed suicide, and I don't, I don't believe that at all. Um, oh, oh, so I wanted to know what you, how you, how you got over or through this of writing a book about Putin and getting facts and and you're okay. You're here. You're alive. Um, well, you know the thing. The thing about uh, any kind of terror and certainly what uh, uh, what journalists and activists have been subjected to in Russia is terror. Right? It's not. Uh, you know, Ru Russia is not. A, uh, it doesn't have state terror on the scale that the Soviet Union did. But certainly, uh, what the opposition is is, um, is subjected to is terror. But it it doesn't work. Uh, by you know, direct threat to against every single person. It works by killing or imprisoning or forcing into exile enough people to get everyone else to shut up. Uh, I think I've been lucky. I think I've been careful enough in the sense that, for example, when I was researching the Putin book, I didn't tell anybody what I was working on. I, everyone I interviewed I uh, uh, thought that I was writing a much more general book about politics. And uh, it wasn't even in the publisher's catalog until it was just about to come out. Uh, only uh, my partner and my research assistant knew what I was working on. Not even my best friend knew what I was working on. So uh, I, think, I think that was prudent. And then by the time it was coming out in, in 20 different languages, uh, it would have been a little costly to to get rid of me, I like to think, or maybe they didn't think about it. Maybe they were thinking about someone else. But, but the other thing, and the, and this and this is to me a very important point. Uh, you know, Russia is one of the, consistently one of the most dangerous countries in the world to be a journalist. Uh, if you go into the Committee to Protect Journalists website, you will see that it consistently ranks in the top ten, not just for danger, but for on, on what they call their impunity index. Right? So not only are journalists killed, but no one is ever arrested uh, and tried for their murders. But if you click through further and you look at a list that the Committee to Protect Journalists posts for every country, and you look at the list of attacks in Russia, you will see that you don't recognize any names. Right? The people who are really in danger are people who are not, you know, who don't, who don't write for the New York Times, right? Uh, who, who can be punished with impunity. You mean are dispensable to the government? Uh, it, dis everybody is dispensable to the government, but sort of the risk-benefit ratio to the government. There's no risk in killing journalists that most people have never heard of, or in beating them up. There, uh, the, there's no reputation, reputational risk for Russia itself. But it gets the message across to other journalists, and the chilling effect inside the country is huge. We'll take two more questions. Question in the center. 
Yes, uh, this was touched on a little bit before, but I'm wondering if you could just speak a, a little bit more about the specific uh, potential for actions or responsibilities of the American Jewish community, because, uh, and I'm bringing it back obviously to the current situation um, in the United States, because, you know, obviously, um, you know, uh, we're, a, we're a minority group, so we're, there's a certain threat, but, you know, we're we have a certain protective sphere. There's we're mostly Ashkenaz communities, so there's the sphere of whiteness. There's the the sphere of um, of our affluence um, and our protection in mostly um, liberal states. So I'm wondering, just in terms of the kind of institutional Jewish community, um, what you think we can do in the coming weeks and months? Um, well, you know, we run the media, right? So. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we need to be using that effectively. Uh, I am. Um, I don't. I'm sorry. You can take it too. Great. Uh, I mean, I'll I'll take a quick stab at it, and then yeah, Sue, if you can, you're probably much better situated to to answer that question. Um, but I'm used to thinking uh, about individuals, uh, and and I think that. Um, so, and, I'm, and I'm used to thinking about the media. So the media, I think, need to have a sort of pact, right? We need to really take stock of this, uh, the, the rights that we consider to be important and inviolate. And before the drift begins, although the drift has already begun, right? The normalization has already begun. We really need to be aware of where our line in the sand is and, 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 and what we need to be protecting and what we demand be respected. I also think Jews as, as, as people have a unique historical understanding of what it is to be immigrants. And considering that the first war that Trump has declared is a war on immigrants, we need to be out there talking about it and, and fighting it every step of the way. And um, I would say, look, 30% of the Jewish community voted for Trump. And I would uh, dare to say that they don't want immigrants to be bullied or they don't want to see swastikas on uh, university walls. I would say that the Jewish community is in, should use its privileged position to stand up for those minorities that are really being threatened. Um, the, the woman in at San Jose State University this weekend who is wearing a hijab who was attacked in a parking garage by a man who, who pushed her and shouted anti-Muslim epithets at her uh, at, in, at Veterans Day Parade in last Friday in Petaluma, three men were waving Confederate flags because they feel it is okay to do that today. Uh, graffiti in in um, Pittsburgh yesterday using the N-word by people who believe that bigotry is now being mobilized. I think there's a tremendous task for the American Jewish community um, now to stand up with those who are really under threat and it doesn't matter who you voted for. Here's the last question, Masha. I want to turn to the... I've got, can I hold it? Uh, I, I want to... Uh, talk about the Israeli Jewish community. Um, you adverted to uh, the degradation of democracy uh, in Israel. Um, it seems to me the great irony of the 20th century is uh, the conversion of Jews, the great victims of ethnic and religious nationalism, suddenly at that time when the internationalist idea uh, became resonant with the creation of the United Nations, the Marshall Plan, and other things. The Jews, with the creation of the State of Israel, have now become the great ethnic and, and religious nationalists and now have their own other. Um, and this, I think, and I think a growing number of American Jews, uh, is, is creating a chasm between American and Israeli Jews. And, and if Maybe the worst model uh, for Trump is not Putin, but Netanyahu. But you've thought about this, and I'm, I'm curious what you have to say about this issue. Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm, I'll be better situated to answer that question uh, in a few months after I've, 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 I've done more research. But um, 
it, it's a great last question because, of course, it brings us back around to the beginning of the conversation when I was talking about Dubnov and his idea of, of Jews as the highest form of nationhood because Jews can't threaten anybody militarily and, and can't get into territorial wars. And, and uh, I mean, it literally, the first time I read that, it brought tears to my eyes uh, because it was such a beautiful description of something that no longer exists. Um, I, um, I'm fascinated with, uh, in, in Israel, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the story I really want to be writing about Israel right now is the role of uh, the Russians, uh, in quotes, because these are Russian-speaking Jews from all over the former Soviet Union, uh, who, um, who broke Israeli democracy. I really, I, I really think they did. Uh, and. Um, what you know, I don't mean by that that they were terrible, evil, anti-democratic people who came to Israel, but I th uh, uh, and uh, and and um, and waged a war in Israeli democracy. But I think that what happened w uh, was if an amazing situation where a million people who were in a state of disconnectedness and and extremely high anxiety and sort of a loss of a vision for the future, all the things that we know to be uh, risk factors for, um, for a rise of, of, a, of, of a populist and, and a potentially fascist movement, all those people landed in Israel at the same time and there was no place for them in the Israeli political matrix. Right? Um, and I think that the impact of that particular group and that, and that relationship to politics has been enormous and underexamined in Israel. So that's the story I'm going to try to write. And I'm going and and so the figure I'm actually even more interested in than Netanyahu is Lieberman. Uh, is Avigdor Lieberman, uh, uh, who's you know, uh, who who figured out a way to ride that wave uh, that, that's uh, that's played such a huge role in turning Israel into what it has become. So I would like to say I just feel very proud um, to be here at the JCC where we have the opportunity to host these really timely and important conversations. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Masha, Sue, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.